So to kick us off, um, I'd like to ask Hannah Jones um, to talk to us, to give us an introduction to multi-species lays. Have you got control there, Hannah? We'll give it a go. There you go, yes. You okay, have. great. <laughs> okay, um, morning everybody. Um, it's very exciting to see so many people here on my screen, even like I'm looking at my bedroom. Um, <laughs> so um, I work at Dutchie College um, as, um, uh, as part of a team um, with uh, Beth and Stag, Gemma Eels and Stephen Roderick. And we worked jointly with um, Northwick and Deb's going to be and Kate are going to be talking a bit later on in that. And we all we're funded by the Agritech um, Cornwall and our a silly group. And we've got our industry partners. Um, which are um, animal vets, so I'm trying to go back if I can't. Um, animal vets, uh, Cornwall Wildlife Trust, Southwest Seeds, and SC Nutrition. So Stephen Kettle's joined us today with his expert advice, and I'll be handing over to him shortly. So just introduction, introducing herbal lays. I apologize, I've got a slight delay on my screens here. Right, so herbal lays, um, very simply, the delay is very long. It's like an international phone call. Just a second. I think it's me changing it. Maybe if you use your keyboard arrows, is that working? Yeah, I'm just trying. I can change it for you if you like. You go, can you go to the yeah. um, second slide, please? This one? Okay, thank you. And if we, I just say to move on when I do. So herbal lays are um, very simply composed of grass, um, forage legumes and herbs or forbs. They can be very simple and indeed a herbal lay can be comprised of three species but some that you can buy which many of you are probably very familiar with can go up to 30 different species um, and varieties. Um, can we move on please? So when we're developing a, a herbal lay mix the first thing you need to think about is uh, what your environment is. So in a um, uh, optimal environment where it's warm, it's plenty of moisture, it's good fertility. Um, for very high yield, you may start with your Italian ryegrass, which I've shown on the left here, um, extraordinarily high yields early season. If that grassland um, obviously needs to be grazed, in many cases, particularly in the southwest, you will be adding perennial ryegrass because you'll get much better um, season as far as yield is concerned. But after two or three years, particularly in some more extreme environments, um, persistence of perennial ryegrass may be going down and a species such as Timothy may be more useful on that particular farming system. Now, again, particularly last year, the year before, under drought conditions, um, Timothy may even struggle slightly in the dry conditions. And under that situation, you may consider adding Coxford um, for its drought tolerance. So working from the left to the right of this picture, you can see with an increasing, increasingly variable environment. And when we talk about environment, I'm thinking about climate, soils and management. You potentially need more species to deal with that increasingly variable environment. Go to the next slide, please. So in addition to de for developing a herbal lay, um, it goes beyond just the simple grasses. So many farmers um, will be using slurries and farmyards manures, but there are some which are still putting ammonium nitrate on their um, grassy swords. To move away from that, a simple nut, um, solution is to put your nitrogen fixing legumes in. And at the top, I've put fertilizer and you can see alongside there is white clover, which is extensively used. So secondly, um, and it has been raised in some of the questions today about um, soil structure and infiltration. So to get rid of that, um, more compacted soil deeper down potentially a plow pan at 30 40 centimeters depth you want to you might use a subsoiler or you can avoid that altogether and go for a deep rooting species such as chicory as shown here um, a number of livestock systems um, will be using wormers great concern about the resistance of worms to the um, veterinary products that are now available so farmers can add to their portfolio of control measures by including anthelmintic species or species that have capacity to reduce worm load in livestock so in your herbal aid then you might choose to add species such as sandfoin which is shown here shown here birds but trefoil or chicory or plantain which add they don't resolve all worm issues but they help to control them and provide a different mode of action for control so fourthly in designing a function for a herbal lay um, 
in a grassland you may a lot of farmers will be using um, herbicides to control some of the more persistent weeds such as docks and thistles in herbal lays because you've got a more complementarity between a range of different leaf types and a denser canopy um, there is increasing evidence that herbal lays have reduced weed um, weed problems under certain management conditions and so potentially you can move away from herbicides under those conditions and finally just using this as an example um, for some farmers um, you um, salt licks and um, boses and such like may be used um, to deal with um, nutrient deficiencies and um, we're working with um, veterinary um, animal vets in Hale to look at if there's scope for using certain species to address some nutrient deficiencies that are commonly occurring in livestock and the herbs potentially have a capacity to do this. Can you move on please Katie? Thank you. So um, just um, overview as part of our work in the TOMS project um, Beth and Stagg led this work and she looked at 77 studies of herbal lays across the literature um, so some of the questions that have been resolved or um, there's increasing evidence for, so first of all on the left, did diverse forages have higher dry matter yield than the control? So of those studies, 68% said yes, and 32% said no, and 47% said there was no difference between the herbal lay and the controls. And that's exactly what we found in our TOMS project in Cornwall. There's no significant yield reduction in herbal lays compared to controls. If we move to the right, did diverse forages have a higher digestibility than the control? So 50% of those studies said yes, and 25% said no, 38% said no difference. And again, that's what we found in our first year of our TOMS project. So moving down to the bottom left, did diverse forages have lower neutral detergent fibre? So this is a level, um, another measure of digestibility. So 73% said yes, and 5% said no. And again, the TOMS project in the first year falls in the middle band, where there's no significant difference in digestibility comparing herbal lays to a control. Now our control is uh, white clover and ryegrass. So that's important consideration when ryegrass is the, the sort of industry standard when you grow these mixtures you're not um there's no digestibility penalty that you're likely to pay and um, so moving to the bottom right did diverse forages have higher crude protein level than the control so 33 percent said yes 29 said percent said no and 48 percent said no difference and that's exactly what we found with our um, um herbal lays that we were trialing in our first year can we move on katie please yeah. Okay. So um, this is just the, the, the uh, second and last slide of these findings. So um, again, thinking of those 77 studies that Bethan looked into, did cows grazing on diverse wards produce a higher milk yield than on the control? So 60% of studies showed that on herbal lays, the cows yielded more milk. 10% said no, and 40% said no difference. To the right, were lambs grazing on diverse wards heavier um, on the herbal lay than on the control and 66% said yes, 55% said no, um, and no difference. And there was no evidence that lambs were lighter on herbal lays compared to a control ryegrass white clover mix. Okay, um, so moving down bottom left, were diverse wards better at suppressing weeds for control? So 74% said yes and 21% said no. So for our work in the first year, the herbal lays were better at suppressing weeds compared to the, the white clover ryegrass control. And finally, did diverse wards reduce nitrogen leaching more than control? 66% said yes, which is exactly what we found in our first year of the herbal lay project. There was reduced nitrate leaching through the herbal lay compared to a, a ryegrass white clover mix. So can we move on, please? Can, um, we just had a few questions come through. It's probably going to be quite difficult to answer uh, with so many different studies, but just around kind of the control and the, how things were measured in terms of the design of the experiments um, and why grass clover sword was the control. Right, okay. Um, yeah, I can see lots of questions already. Gosh, that's daunting. Right, okay. Um, so um, 
the, why don't the, the percentages add up to 100 I saw? The percentages do not add up to 100, as you can see on the clipboard, because some studies compared multiple swords. So it was just the means of, of actually assessing um, the different findings from those projects. Um, so what was in the control treatment? So the control treatment um, was, um, in most cases, perennial ryegrass and white clover in these studies. For our study, the TOMS project, it's perennial ryegrass and white clover. It was chosen as the control because it's the most common option um, in our area. And um, Stephen Kettle will probably have to give some, some more information on that. Um, uh, why was the grass clover for the control? Okay, is that, um, do you want me to leave it there for the moment, Katie? Yeah, maybe, yeah, I think Bethan's answered that one, hasn't she? So. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Bethan. Right. <laughs> okay, um, so if we move on, so um, for individuals, you may say, which species should I grow? So along the top, I've got uh, in the black, I've just given some examples of species that could be grown, uh, red clover, white clover, alcite clover, etc. And down the left, going down on the column side, I've selected a random range of functions that you may wish for a particular lay treatment. Move that down, next slide, please. So here um, you can tick the boxes, so red clover, white clover, alcite, lucerne are all forage legumes, so naturally you can fix nitrogen, so increase fertility building. Species such as coxfoot, chicory and plantain are drought tolerant and alcite clover is more drought tolerant than red clover, so it's intermediate. Um, so you can start populating these tables in which species are potentially suitable for you. Next slide please. And then superimpose, oh, go up, up one. So superimpose on this, you may say, well, my soils are acidic. And under acidic conditions, you don't really, it's not wise to try lucerne, it probably won't grow. So you hone in your mix onto the white clover and alcite clover as fertility building, for example. Um, and if it's drought tolerant, you alcite clover will obviously be fertility building, drought tolerant, and waterlogging resistant as well. So Again, you'll start honing in, and then if you go to the last side, next slide please. So on alkaline soils, again, you are picking a different range of species for your particular portfolio. Um, so these are just examples of what ultimately we all hope to be able to achieve in a very, very detailed way. Next slide, please. So um, just to end this introduction, so the composition of herb or lays is highly variable. Um, there's the environment effect, so soil plus climate. and the weather as well, so the variability of weather year on year, um, a dry May, June can be disastrous um, for um, some cuts, for example. And then on top of that, management. So what, how do you graze? Um, which which um, livestock do you have? Um, can make a massive difference on the per, um, persistence of some species. Um, as a general uh, rule, the more variable the environment, or the management, the greater the need for a diverse range of species, so the more species you need. Remember, if you're only cutting silage in the optimal environment, Italian ryegrass may be best for the job. But as you add more variability, you need more species. And the third point, the more functions that you need for your um, lay, the greater the need for the range of species. For example, when I was talking about anthelmintics, you know, you need to add some of those um, to, to help control the worms. Um, last slide. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge our industry partners, Patrick, Stephen, Jane, Steve, and Bruce Knight contributed to the inoculum. And then all the farmers who've been absolutely fantastic to work with and our colleagues at um, uh, Northwick as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Um, I think you've covered quite a lot of the, the questions that came through there in terms of um, questions around the different species and, and variability in, in yields and performance. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any additional questions at this stage. Um, I guess one question that, that came through fairly consistently was around how species change over time um, and how, how you manage that element. <clears throat> Um, so um, the uh, I'm, I'm I'm probably going to talk a lot more about that in the um, when I do the main talk. Yeah. Can I do let's later? Do that. Yeah, let's do that it'll, later. You're linking with what Stephen Kettle's going to say as well. If that's okay. Fantastic. Yeah, we'll pick yeah. up on that later. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, and now 
hopefully can pass the controls over to Deb. Okay. Deborah Baymont from Rothamsted Research. Right. Let's just try that. Okay. Hello. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to the establishment and management of multi species lays, and I'll be looking forward to hearing from some of you about your experiences of establishing and management of herbal lays later on today. Um, what has worked for you and what hasn't worked for you? So, basically, I'll just. Oh, um, could you turn over my slide, please, Katie? I can't move it forward. Brilliant. Okay. So basically, uh, multi-species seed mixes are expensive compared to um, a typical perennial ryegrass or perennial ryegrass and white clover mix. And as you can't apply a blanket herbicide once those multi-species are sown, then it's really good if you spend a little bit of time thinking about your establishment options. We have run several multi-species lay experiments at Northwick and the first one was called the Wild Scale Enhancement of Biodiversity known as WEB which was a DEFRA funded project and our collaborators for that were the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology and what we wanted to achieve with that was to create modest increases of, um, of, of the sward in fertile soils and, and to help inform environmental stewardship schemes. So the results from this project led onto the environmental stewardship scheme called the EK21, the legume and herb rich species sward. So many, one of our main interests was how to establish these species, these multi-species swords into a fertile grassland. So what we did, we um, ploughed and some seed beds. So using a conventional, we sprayed with a glyphosate and then we ploughed to a depth of about 25 to 30 centimetres and inverted the soil. And we followed that with a power harrow. And then to do a minimum tillage uh, comparison, because we were interested to see, could you establish these multi-species swords using the minimum till um, method? Um, to because obviously minimum till is has many advantages of um, reducing the disturbance to your soil and retaining the soil nutrients within your soil and less soil erosion and see if that would work. So basically we did the min till option by using a slot sleeder and as you can see in the picture on the right that sort of disturbed the sward about 40 to 50 percent and um, so basically some of the sward is still left and then we broadcast those, a grass legging forb mix into the ploughed and into the minimum till um, seabeds. And what we discovered from that is that on our, on our clay soils, then the um, species didn't establish particularly well on the, on the minimum till option using a slot seeder. So that just showed that basically to get more successful establishments on our farm, we would have had to destroy more of the existing sward to reduce the competition from that sward to get better establishment. Okay, I'll try and move my slide forward. Um, could you move it forward, please, Katie? Thank you. Okay, so Hannah has been talking about the Tom's project. So we have um, a multi-plot experiment at Northwick, Rotham said Research, which is near Oakhampton, on uh, heavy clay soil. And what we wanted to do is we still wanted to look at introducing, oh, it's gone forward somehow. <laughs> you take it back, sorry, Katie. <laughs> oh, I don't know why, oh, basically, okay, thank you. So what we wanted to do was to see could we still use a multi-species um, sword? Can we establish it into a few questions coming in with your so it's jumped forward again. Sorry, Katie. So we have a few technical issues here. <laughs> so basically we tried some minimal tillage options that would destroy more of the existing sword than what we experienced with the web project. So we ploughed some seed beds using 
conventional plow and we sprayed glyphosate first. We also used a power harrow, which um, again we sprayed this time with glyphosate and that went down to a depth of about five centimetres. So there's still a little bit of existing sward left. And then we used a disc harrow to plow, uh, uh, to disturb the soil a little bit more to a depth between 10 to 15 centimetres. So we could compare the three different seabed preparations. So we created three seabeds of each type and then we compa compared the results. Could you move it forward please, Katie? Thank you very much. So with the TOMS, um, uh, experiment. What we did, we, like Hannah explained before, we used a binary control using perennial ryegrass and white clover and the big, the Tom's mix, which is a combination of 18 species, so a combination of grass, legumes and forb species, and then we used two intermediate um, seed mixes, you're looking at six species and a 12 species mix. Now we sowed these species into the different seed beds using a conventional sowing rate at 14 kilograms per acre and also an additional 50% because we were interested to see if the extra sowing rate would help suppress weeds. Could you move us forward please, Katie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, it seems to be delayed in how it's doing that. I did have a quick question around, well, maybe we can pick it up. Sure, get that there, around, yep. uh, Lydia Smith on strip tillage, if you considered looking at strip tillage. Um, yeah, we haven't actually done that at Northwick. The trouble with these experiments is they get bigger and bigger and bigger. So I'd be interested to hear later on from people, have they tried um, under sowing? or over sowing and their different experiences and what they've found that's like, successful on their farms. Okay, is that all right for now, Katie? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so basically the first year of results, what we found, so this is a, a photograph of the nine seabeds and there's randomly allocated three different cultivation techniques. So we compared when we look compared the ploughed and the mintil um, cultivation seabeds, we had some good news. Basically, there was no difference between the annual total yield, so that was good. When we looked at, however, when we looked at the abundance of the sown species, we found that the sown species established better in the ploughed seabeds compared to the disc harrow and the power harrow. So the weeds were generally lower under the ploughing. Um, cultivation. So basically that will have implications for the longevity of the swords. So as we look forward to this year's results, um, we, we might see that basically more species will persist in the ploughed plots rather than in tills because we've got better establishment in the first place in the ploughed seabeds. And also that might have implications on the quality of the forage. So basically if you have better you know, establishments in the plow pots, then when we actually look at the chemical analysis of those, um, the forage coming off those plow pots, they, in theory, could be better quality than from the min till pots, but we're waiting for those results. So the good news was when we looked at the um, four different seed mixes, so when we compared the binary control with the th three more complex seed mixes, the six, the 12 and the 18, uh, the, there was no penalty from um, growing a herbal lay in compared to a perennial ryegrass and white clover. So that what Hannah and Hannah's team found on the farms as well from Tom's experiments. When we looked at the more complex seed mixes, the more diverse seed mixes compared to the binary control, we found that they did reduce the swede invasion, so they suppressed the weeds compared to the binary mix. And obviously that is good news because that will have implications for forage quality as well. And then finally, when we can look at the results from sowing at a higher rate, we were expecting, well, possibly that would help to suppress the weeds. And we actually found that there was no, that made no difference at all to either the yield or the weed suppression. So from our first year results, um, we're suggesting that basically what isn't worth the investment of throwing more seeds at your fields. Um, could you move me on please, Katie? Thank you. Okay, so 
So as well as uh, preparing your seedbeds, there's lots of different things to consider as well when you become to establishing multi-species wards. So sowing time is very important. Basically, most grass species will germinate at around seven degrees. Um, uh, so basically, you could, you could sow those quite early or a bit late in the springtime and a bit later in the autumn. But legume and herb species will generally germinate in warmer soil conditions, so around eight to 10 degrees. So timing of your sowing with multi-species lays is, is quite important. At Northwick, we generally go for um, uh, an autumn sow. So that means you've still got some soil, good soil moisture in, in your soil. And also the temperature in late August, early September is still warm enough for the legumes and the forbs to germinate. But um, that, um, so I've lost my thought with pride. <laughs> so, so basically, um, you know, that, that, that's good. So if you sow in June, or July time, then the soil moisture would be too low and you wouldn't get successful um, germination. So basically that, and all, that would create gaps in your sward and you might not get as good establishment if you sowed in drier conditions. Hannah was talking about species selection and also that, that was obviously very important to look at your soil type and have a look at, is it an alkaline soil? Is it an acidic soil or neutral soil? Because there's no point putting in a species if it's not going to germinate and establish well in your field. So at Northwick, we wouldn't put in, say, sand form in because that would need a more alkaline based soil than what we have at Northwick. The sowing method is also um, very important as well. So basically, the general advice is to broad sow. Uh, to broadcast your multi-species source because that would give a more even distribution to your sward, um, reducing the um, chance of weeds for getting in. If you do decide to um, drill, then the advice is to use a shallow drill because most, a lot of the species that you use in a multi-species lay are quite small, things like the legumes, and what you don't want to do is to bury them deep into, into your soil. Basically, you should only be looking at about one centimetre to half an inch depth. We have tried um, air drilling at Northwick. So here's a photograph on the right there of an Einbach um, air drill. So basically that just scratches the surface and then just um, develops small uh, slots for the seeds to drop into. Another important factor is to roll immediately after you've sown so you get um, a good soil to seed contact and to lock in that soil moisture. At Northwick we generally roll in multi-species swords twice and, and that seems to work quite well. Uh, regarding weed control, again that's another important factor because these seed mixes are expensive, you want good establishments and you don't want these weeds crip, um, you know, competing with your expensive um, um, uh, herbs that you put in. So basically what I would advise you to do is, is to have a look at your field and have a look what are the dominant species in your field. And then you can look at the weed ecology of those, those weeds. So from the Tom's experiments, in hindsight, if, if we'd have had a, a good spring, I'd have gone for a spring sowing rather than an autumn sow because our main weed species in the Tom's uh, plots is Yorkshire fog. Now, Yorkshire fog mainly germinates in the autumn. So when we did uh, prepare the, se the seed beds in the autumn, um, that obviously created bare ground and, uh, and lights, and the, the, um, the Yorkshire fog in the seed bank went, oh, fan great, fantastic. And we got an influx of that Yorkshire fog um, taking hold of our seed beds. So because that was uh, when, you know, if, um, it's a permanent grassland, and, and the Yorkshire fog was, was the main weed species in that permanent grassland. So with hindsight, I would have gone for a spring to uh, sow with, with that. And also with weed control, it's really important, um, basically not to graze initially too aggressively, or if you've got wet conditions, not to poach your soil, because obviously that would create gaps, and then that would create opportunities for the weeds to get a foothold.
Uh, one last thing, if you can see on, on the left bottom there, is, uh, you know, to, is to protect your seedlings early on after sowing. So basically, when, when there's, there's herbs and, and legumes are quite small, is not to put the, the cattle or the sheep or to cut too early. The general advice is if you go for an autumn sow, is to leave that field alone for six to eight weeks, let it get established a little bit, and then possibly do a light graze in late autumn, just before to knock down the growth before, before the winter sets in. Okay, so um, Katie, could you move the side forward, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, we've also had a couple of interesting oh. comments and questions come through there. Um, got Kevin Duncan um, talking about his trials um, and has found good success of spraying off and then using a grind tarot to stitch it in, but that's on a, a well grey sword. Um, but on that, then other people asking about um, do, do you have to use glyphosate, basically? Is there an option for, for not using glyphosate? Yeah, we, with our, of our trials, obviously, in the web experiment uh, back in 2008 to 2012, we did try a mint hill um, without herbicide, and the comparison was applied with herbicide. And we did find that the establishment was quite poor in that um, a scenario. But our um, collaborators, the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology, they used a more aggressive mint hill. They used a disc harrow um, without glyphosate, and they got an, you know, a fairly good uh, establishment um, with, their, with their sword. So it's comparable, the actual establishment, with, with the actual ploughed option. So I think it's just a case of trial and error. You know, maybe if you can afford to try on your farm, just um, um, do on one field and just try experiment with, with different techniques and, and just see what works on your particular farm and, and on a field by field basis as well, because you'll get different weeds and different seed banks, you know, depending on how wet your field is, um, the soil compaction, all kinds of factors. So farmers uh, are generally, they're, you know, uh, very good scientists, actually. They're always investigating what works best from them and, and working with your, your seed suppliers and, and getting advice from them. You know, what do they think would work well? in a particular field, especially taking an, into consideration how you'll be managing that um, sword afterwards, whether you be cutting for silage or grazing. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, thank you, yeah. Okay, so then we come on to, I'm only gonna give a very brief overview of management because um, this will be uh, dealt with more in, in part two on the 4th of July. 4th of June even, I don't know why I said the 4th of July. <laughs> okay, so, so basically um, with, with um, herbal seed mixes, because you want to keep as many species in as possible, um, most farmers go for a rotational grazing system rather than a set stocking system. And that is because you can graze the swords and then move them on and back fence to protect your species so then they can recover and the and the cattle or the sheep can't go back to the species that they find particularly tasty or palatable so that stops cherry picking because if an animal keeps returning to their favorite species such as say you know of um, a chicory or um, uh, maybe oxide daisy, something like that, they can nip off the crown and if they keep returning, they can actually kill that plant. So by moving on the animals and giving that sword a time to recover, you can increase the longevity of all and keep all the species that you actually want in your lay. And by a rotational grazing system, you often find that that can maximise your production of of the grazing animal, you're sort of utilizing the grassland in a more efficient way. So you can actually get a, more, a higher return and actually extend the grazing um, the season as well, reducing the costs of housing those animals over winter. Now mob grazing is a more intensive form of um, rotational grazing. And basically all it means is that you are stocking at a higher rate. So and moving on your animals more frequently, often on a daily basis. And that means that your pastures are evenly grazed 
and your manure is more evenly distributed and that will help improve your soil as well. It prevents cherry picking as I've mentioned um, uh, earlier and can also extend your grazing se um, season. There's also now, a question take there, if, sorry, if, yeah, for, go on, just if, if you do let it go to seed, can that extend the life of the sword? It, it can do. So, so basically, um, it depends what your management system is. If, if uh, you're looking for, to increase pollinators in, in, your, in your system and um, you might decide to, you know, to leave it to go a little bit longer and then you will increase your pollinators and then those certain, certain plants will set seed and that will give them opportunity to, um, to develop and, you know, and germinate and continue. So it's getting that balance, really. Absolutely. Okay? Yeah. yeah, thank you. There's another question around sure. extent the, um, the, at which point in the plant life cycle is the lay most beneficial to the soil? Well, I think we'll pick up on that um, a bit later on, if that's okay. okay. That, that's cool, yeah. So a uh, rotational grazing system, it does need, require a little bit of thought and some infrastructure, which um, Sarah Morgan will be talking about in part two on the 4th of July. But basically, um, you need to consider your paddock size. So that would depend on how, how um, many, the, your stocking density, how much land you have available, um, your breed of your cattle or your sheep, and also um, your water system. So you've got to think about what kind of water troughs can you, you know, can you purchase and, and the water connections to make your system efficient. And, um, and, you know, and have you got the labor, the time to actually move your animals on quite frequently. And one last thing is to consider if, you're, if you've got cattle, you can get away with just one strand of electricity fencing. And if you've got sheep, as we all know, they can get out and about quite easily. So then you would require three strands of electric fencing. Um, Katie, could you move on to the next slide, please? Okay, again, this is just a very brief overview because um, Kate Lecoq will be talking about this uh, in part two. But um, if you find that you have a rotational grazing system and you have some, one of your paddocks, you've got some surplus. So basically your, your swords are outgrowing what your cattle or your sheep can graze, you could pull out a cell, a strip or a paddock from that rotational system and you can cut it for silage or for haylage. Um, and also with, with, um, with silage production, you could think about how frequently you can cut for silage. So if you look at the top picture, you can see it's all fresh and juicy looking and very palatable. So if you keep cutting at maybe five, four to six intervals, you will keep your forage at a young stage. So a high sort of quality of silage. Alternatively, you could get, um, you know, if you look at the bottom, right, you get more stemmy structures going on and then um, higher dry matter yields. So you might decide to bale up the haylage rather than silage. And also when you're considering um, silage it might be worth considering a more simple mix than you would for if you say you're going in for environmental stewardship scheme so maybe three or four species um, and, and talking to your seed supply and think well if I put in you know, just maybe timothy ryegrass or white clover and a red clover you know I could get decent sort of forage quality from that as and, and maybe you know chicory and um, and still get environmental benefits of, of improving your soil structure as well as getting good quality silage. Okay, can you move on to the last slide please, Katie? Okay, so just one little thought about clovers. Um, basically, as we all know, clovers are high in crude protein. And if you um, keep your dry matter content to about 30% of your um, total sward, then you won't need any artificial nitrogen um, to add to your sward. Basically, if you have about 30% dry matter content of legumes in your sward, that's about equivalent of 150 kilograms per nitrogen per hectare per year getting fixed in your field. But as you look at those photographs on the right hand side, these are taken from the, the Tom's experiment, you can see that the 
the amount of clover in your sward varies through the season. So at the top right, you can see at the first cut of the Tom's experiment, there's hardly any clover in your sward. And then on the second cut, we can see lots of white clover coming in. And late, that's in July. And on the last cut in le um, late September, you can see again, we have a lot of um, clover content. And that is because um, clovers tend to grow uh, in warmer conditions compared to grass. So they tend to come in later on through the growing season. So if you have, oh, sorry, <laughs> keep looking on. Um, so, so basically, um, clovers are fantastic. You can get lots of benefit from them. And they're also good for pollinators. Uh, but if you have concerns you know, about floats, then you might want to add on some nitrogen to knock back the clover to encourage the growth of your competitive grass species. And the last thing I want to say is, is red clover. Obviously with red clover, the general advice is not to feed or graze red clover a six sides uh, with breeding ewes, six sides either side of tupping. So basically, um, if I would advise, if you've got concerns about that and to have flexibility with breeding ewes, would maybe have um, a, some field set aside with a multi species mix that have red clover and some that don't. So you could utilize the um, uh, fields of red clover for good forage quality and for good land production without worrying about um, you know, utilizing those for your breeding use. So on the very last slide, thanks Katie. I would just like to thank everybody for, for listening and participating today. And I'd like to thank everybody who has worked on the TOMS and the web projects. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Deb. Um, we've had quite a lot of um, questions and comments come through. So we'll try and pick up on some at the end. And I can see that Hannah's answered some of them as well. Um, one quick one was just, can mob grazing reduce bloats? Is there any suggestion that that might be the case? Sorry, um, Katie, you, so could mob grazing reduce? Bloat. Bloats. Um, I suppose if you're moving, I haven't really looked into this, but I suppose if you're moving on your animals quite um, frequently, um, basically you're grazing those swords evenly. So in that case, you shouldn't get any one species dominating. So that should keep your clovers in check. So reducing the risk of bloat, keeping your content um, of clover to about, you know, 30% is, you know, is what you're aiming for. Does that help answer that? Yeah, absolutely. And then Lydia Smith just suggested adding samphoin to the red clover to prevent bloat as well. So that's something else to consider. Yeah, there's also, um, yeah, it's a good idea. Uh, samphoin is um, high in tannins, as is another in, in Weta and in, in Devon. Um, we find like bird's foot truffle that has a bio, the bio compounds of, uh, con condensed tannins as well so like sand poi that will reduce bloat fantastic yeah brilliant all right well we'll try and pick up on more of these questions later on um we can pass over to hannah thanks so much deb no problem. that's really addressed a lot of the questions that people sent through in when they registered so um can i just mention about bloat <laughs> um <laughs> just to comment on that one um i completely agree with um deb um, there are some farmers who grass and then I'll flick out the cows that have calved into a different group and then they're gonna in these smaller groups okay well so what we do is at the moment we're calving at the moment so we're sort of giving the cows about half a heck right okay I've got some interruption there um I don't know if you did we did, yeah. yeah. Okay, could, I, it, it's great to have people in the discussion, but if you could mute yourselves for now and then we'll pick up in the discussion at the end. Yeah, Please. I think it might have been a phone call, actually. <laughs> um, yeah. um, so, uh, sorry, where was I? So for um, bloat, there are some farmers who can graze a very rich um, legume uh, clover sward, um, well over 30%, um, which is a surprise. And, you know, according to general knowledge, you know, it's, it's high risk. Um, I think there is an element of, um, the uh, previous feed of the livestock. So a high risk movement is to go from concentrates over and a winter ration straight onto a very rich clover sward. And that's high, rich, high, high risk for bloat. But if stock are introduced to it very slowly and their guts can adapt over a slow time period, that is much lower risk. 
and in addition um, the um, biochemicals that induce bloat are water soluble so it's better to introduce stock onto a drier sward in the afternoon than a dewy one early in the morning um, but again um, these are just sort of anecdotal um, discussions I've had with farmers. Okay, right. Um, so, um, Katie, would you mind doing my slides for me, please? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, to focus specifically on what our um, Tom's Herbal A mix composed, the legumes were white clover, red clover, and a cross between these two clovers called outside clover. Um, Some of you may have come across it. Um, it generally has the better contribution better characteristics of both white clover and red clover in the fact it's more resilient and then there was lucerne, sandfoin and bird's foot trefoil. Within the grasses was perennial ryegrass, timothy, festulolium, meadow fescue, meadow foxtail and coxfoot and in the forbs chicory plantain, salad burnet, yarrow, sheep parsley and self heel. So this mix was designed by um, Southwest Seeds and we asked for a very diverse mix and Deb is working with this one as she previously mentioned um, at Northwick. So if you move on, please. So our trials um, included um, nine farm sites across Cornwall, and we also had um, a sort of traditional um, trial design at Dutchie College, Stoke Clinton. And today I'm just going to mention or talk about very briefly our nine farm sites, which spanned a whole range of different soil types across Cornwall, from acid to alkali, sheep systems, mainly cat systems, all the way through to um, cattle. Um, so we were looking at species presence and dominance in those different swords, micronutrients in the herbs, um, forage quality and yield, and also effects of rhizobia inoculant. Um, but today I've been asked to focus on species presence and dominance mainly. So in these field trials, um, the farmers were given 20 kilos of the herbal lay toms mix to drill in whichever way they chose alongside the control which is perennial ryegrass and white clover. And then in addition, we compared it to their own benchmark variety, which we call the farm standard. Can we move on, please? So as part of our work, we looked at three time points of early season, um, just before the first grazing or silage cut. So it ranged from um, very, very late March, generally April, um, mid season, sort of June, July, and late season, which could be from August to October. So we looked at, the species and how um, presence and abundance how they change through the season um, and this is an example of the very meticulous and <laughs> time-consuming process of separating out species in the lab okay next slide please so um, four species presence from our work um, in the yellow um, the species that made up 50 percent or 15 percent on average of the fresh weight of all swords across those farm sites and I call this the A team or the top top four, chicory, plantain, ryegrass and white clover, highly reliable in their presence and contribution to the sward. In the orange, um, there are those which were present in 50% 50 50 or more of our assessments. I should mention that these assessments are 135 assessed quadrats, so that's five quadrats per sward, three visits per season on nine farms. So Coxfoot, Festulolian, Timothy, Red Clover and Yarrow had a high persistence but a low contribution to the fresh weight of that sward and then the species were present in less than 25 percent of assessments so they were quite rare in even though they were sown this is only the first year we didn't see much of meadow foxtail lucerne sandfoin salad burnet self heel and sheep's parsley so remember these trials are done in the southwest um, so you may experience something quite different elsewhere in the country you can move on please so key point um, we picked up on, and I think Stephen Kettle has got a lot more information, which I'll hand over to in a minute, but their succession within a year. So early season, um, you um, the soils are cooler and which favours the grasses and late season, the warm soil favours the clovers. So early season, you'll, the composition of the sward will change throughout the year. Um, in addition, the succession in subsequent years, so those species that were low, low presence in the first year, such as Coxfoot, quite commonly um, start having a greater hold in subsequent years. Um, so this year, the first site I've sampled chicory is, um, no, Coxfoot has gone up quite a lot compared to ryegrass. And then um, the percentage of each species with a mix makes a massive difference. So if you can move on to the next slide, please. Um, so, for example, on two farm sites that were grown, the GS4 agri-environment option, which I think Becky Hughes might mention a lot more of, the red, the red clover made up 45% on one farm and 72% on the 
um, on another farm with a fresh weight of these swords. So think about the, the amount of each species you want in your seed mix. And um, just briefly, if I go on to the next slide and then I'm, I've got questions for Stephen. Um, um, as part of our TOMS project, major work that's been done by my colleagues Gemma and Bethan is we use it, we're developing an app and card setup where um, farmers can um, do identification of their swords on farm. Um, they can look at, um, monitor the species that are present and um, it will sort of guide you in which species are suitable for your farm. So, um, and the first version of that will be out by the end of this year. Okay, I should mention that. So if I can go back to the previous slide, please. So, um, Stephen, um, are you there? Yeah, thank you. Yes. <laughs> right. So, um, I mean, just as far as the, the composition of the mixes are concerned, um, you know, as far as legumes to grasses to forbs, what's your thoughts on that? Um, the thing is, with a lot of the, the clovers, it's always very difficult when you put in a mixture together to, to get the right balance for the particular farm. Obviously, clovers will prefer a higher pH, so you probably get them establishing better in a higher pH than you would in a lower pH soil. Um, the other thing is with clover seed, we can have within the laboratory um, germination of probably 93 to 98 percent. Putting them into the soil and to the ground, the establishment can be as low as 11 percent. But in some years, if you have a very good clover establishment, you can get 60 to 70 percent of it establishing quite easily. So to get the balance in the field is always a bit of a hidden miss from the seedsman's point of view. So we generally try and stick to a, a fairly standard type of quantity we put into the lay, and hopefully it'll happen, you know, a fairly good average from year to year. The other thing is with clovers, you can get one year which will give you a lot more clover than the second year. So each year can be a little bit different. And obviously with red clovers, you know, they've only got a limited time within the lay as well. So you've got to be very careful about how you use red clover. If you want a red clover to persist in a long-term lay, obviously you've got to let the clover come to seed probably every two or three years to uh, release seeds back onto the ground. Thank you. Um, just going back to some of the questions that we received um, before um, before we came on. Um, there's, there's two sets of um, conditions. Um, which species are good for um, waterlogged and wet soils? If you're looking for the water logging uh, grasses, then the fescues, metafescues, tall fescues are always a very good one, and also timothies. Both of those sort of species prefer their feet in cooler, damper soils and will probably outperform perennial rye grasses in the same situation. And on the inverse, um, what species are best suited for sandy loam soils? If you're on the, on the the other side of the equation, um, you're looking probably at uh, Festololium, uh, which was always uh, dealt with as a sandy soil type product because of its deep rooting. You've also got Coxfoot and Timothy, which are also deep rooting as well. So they're the ones which will go down for the moistures. Um, and obviously, if you've got clovers in there as well, they will like the, uh, the drier soils as well. So is that the same in terms of performance in dry weather? We had quite a few questions around that as well, in terms of resilience to climate extremes. Yeah, I mean, when, when I'm making up a, a mixture for a particular farm, you know, the questions I have to go through is what sort of soil types you're on, what sort of pH is, whether it's damp soils or dry soils. So you can sort of formulate a mixture to, to suit the particular field that we're talking about. Great. Um, do you want to hand over, Katie, have you got the list of questions? Or? Uh, there was just another question, were a few questions around kind of um, mixtures that are better suited to well, mob grazing versus a kind of continuous grazing system. If, um, the, yeah, any kind of favoured species for that? Um, well, whether you've got... Um different uh, situations. A lot of farms uh, will change their uh, orientation sometimes from year to year. So when we're putting the mixture together, again, we, we will ask the questions, how and uh, the soil types, what sort of grazing, what sort of regime are we looking at, 
we're looking at continual grazing, are we looking at silage or haylage, how many times we're putting a silage. When we're starting to put the mixtures together, it will depend on the, uh, the farm and what they want it to do. It depends on how we build that mixture up around what they're requiring. So we, we've got to be very careful and, and understand what the farm is trying to achieve. And obviously you've got um, anything from the Italian ryegrass, which you're going to use for, for more uh, short-term cutting mixtures, uh, right through to late perennials, which are obviously going to be there for the grazing. And then we have to balance it all out with using diploids and tetraploids um, to, to try and get higher sugar levels uh, uh, and more bulk with the tetraploids than just the diploids. Then obviously we've got to look at the type of stock we're using. Obviously you're not going to put um, horses onto uh, clover lays and whatever else. So we've got to bear in mind what the, the customer from our point of view is looking at and wants to achieve and then we can build a mixture around their requirements. Great. Yeah, thank you. And then a question from Emily Grant here. Is it useful to mix species by their seasonal productivity? So if you need to graze in winter, would you exclude some species as they'll be grazed out? You've always got to take that into, into consideration. I mean, a lot of the grasses, you can take perennial rye grasses, we can look at the, uh, how quickly they come to head in the, through the year. So you've got uh, early grasses, early diploids, and in tetraploids, late, I mean, intermediates and lates, all depend on the heading dates. And within, within that, some of those grasses will come early in the season, some come mid-season, some at the end of the season. Um, but when we're looking at uh, putting in herbs and things like that, we've got to bear in mind exactly how they want to treat that field during the winter as well. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. I think there's a few other questions, um, but we'll, we'll pick them up a bit later um, on kind of the animal health and, and parasites, um, if that's okay. Um, on, um, is there, um, or should we pick that up now? I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> I think move on maybe to, because yeah. there was a question on Jess Just Ford, Ford, Exactly, yeah. so if that's okay, I think we will move on. So. Um, we had a question on uh, GS4 mix designed for pollinator grazing livestock. Well, Handley, um, Becky Hughes um, from LEAF um, is here to tell us a bit about the stewardship options. So if I can hand over to Becky. Thank you so much to Stephen and Hannah. Um, and hopefully we'll, I'm sure we'll have more questions related to species selection as um, we go on as well. Thank you. Everyone, um, I apologise for any background noise. I've got some bales going by and what sounds like Hell's Angels going to the beach <laughs> today. <laughs> um, we can't hear them actually. So, <laughs> Hopefully you can all hear me. It's a lovely day down here in Cornwall and everyone's out again now. So um, yeah. what I want to do really is just talk about very generally about why um, herbal lays are such a popular option I suppose in the stewardship and potentially in the future elms as well and why within CFE it's you know one of our measures that we like to promote so you know what all the the, the positive outcomes that they provide for public goods really um, and the the delivery of the public goods the broad outcomes and the benefits that we get from a multi-species sward are obviously all dependent on the right type of management for the right type of lay in the right place. So um, it might be quite easy to tick a box and say, okay, I've got a you know, multi-species sward established on my farm or as part of my rotation, but unless you're managing that well, not only will it not deliver for your farm in terms of productivity, but it won't deliver all these other benefits and things as well. So that's something that, you know, it all comes down to the good management, really. Um, also, just another a confusion that we often come across when we're talking to different farmers is the difference between a kind of a multi-species sward and um, a species-rich grassland habitat, for example. So herbal lays and multi-species swards, they can't replace, in terms of environmental benefit, they can't replace species-rich semi-natural grassland habitats. Um, the value of a long-term permanent grassland habitat is massive in terms of the, the microbial communities and um, the range of locally specific kind of plants and, you know, the floral communities that have established and developed over hundreds of years, potentially. 
the, the land cover and the landscape that we've got there. It's kind of the trying to compare the inherent value of a semi-natural habitat to the, you know, the, the managed um, the managed land cover of a herbal lay. The two don't really match up. So even though you might have a high species diversity in your herbal lay, it, it can't provide the same thing that a semi-natural grassland habitat does for your wider environment. It's kind of like comparing an ancient woodland, um, you know, to a, to a heavily stocked timber plantation. They both have advantages in their own right, but um, you know we can't we can't really compare the two. But saying that, a, you know, a herbal as we've been hearing, there are lots of advantages of diverse swards over what we see an awful lot of in Devon and Cornwall is you know your standard management of a rye, rye grass and white clover lay. And so, you know, this is what I just want to kind of sum up really. In terms of soil health and uh, soil carbon, it's a, it's a shame that Becky can't be here today, but the, um, the soil carbon project that she's working on in Cornwall is getting some great results in terms of demonstrating the, the sequestration benefits of um, herbal lays. So essentially you're building up a lot more soil organic matter. You've got a lot more diverse root communities and things like that. And so the greater amount of organic matter that's being captured in the soil profile means that you're sequestering an awful lot of carbon there. And that's obviously that's gonna, something that's gonna be ticking the box for um, government support and kind of public goods for a long time yet. So we've got that organic matter build up. But also that also leads on to, you know, improvements in soil structure. We've already had, you know, lots of mentions about deep rooting and drought resilience and flood resilience and things as well, which is important, not just for your, when you're thinking about productivity for your own farm, but also in the catchment that you're working in. You know, if you've got a better structured soil, which can hold on to water and can drain water more effectively, you're going to be having a positive impact on natural flood management and on drought resilience and things like that. So that's another factor that it affects on. And nitrogen is one of the things we've seen a few questions in the chat about, you know, the pros and cons of um, using nitrogen on a herbal lay. Um, if you can reduce the amount of inorganic nitrogen and things that you need to maintain your grassland, um, it's going to tick the box for clean air. Um, ammonia and um, NOx and things are going to be one of the government's priorities. So we'll be looking to reduce the amount of inorganic nitrogen in particular that we rely on. Um, it's got, that's got benefits for the farm business, you know, the bottom line as well. If, you're, if you can produce your own nitrogen or if you can reduce your reliance on bought-in fertilisers, then that's a big plus but it's also something that's gonna help with air quality in the future as well. Um, I personally would like to know more about livestock health. Um, the events that I've been along to and have been part of with herbal lays, for me, it's still a bit unclear. The evidence isn't as clear cut as, as we kind of want it to be. It seems more anecdotal and something that is perhaps down to the personal experience of, of the individual farmer. But if we can show that herbal lays reduce that reliance on anthelmintics and things like that. It's going to be supporting greater um, microbial communities. Um, in particular, if you think about the relationship between dung beetles and important wildlife like greater horseshoe bats, um, swifts and swallows and things like that, and particularly in Cornwall, um, the chuffs, we've, you know, the kind of an iconic bird for Cornwall, they really rely on those, um, you know, the mini beasts that depend on the dung and things in our, you know, in our pastures. So if we can reduce the amount of livestock medication that's getting out into the environment, then that will have really positive knock-on benefits. And then I think the main one that everybody always thinks of when they think of herbal lays and things is the benefit for pollinating insects. And it's not just about um, the fact that we're gonna have more pollen, particularly through the red clover, it's that in a really diverse sward, you're hopefully going to have a different range of different flower shapes and um, different flowering times and things as well. So whilst your pollen and nectar margins within an arable farm, they're going to provide a feast of pollen or a feast of nectar, at, you know, in a, in a narrow window within the summer. Um, a herbal lay that's got different flowering species in it and that is flowering at different times of the year is going to be attractive to a much wider range of insects 
over a much longer season. So in that way, they're a lot, they're more beneficial in actually creating and supporting sustainable long-term um, populations of pollinating insects in the countryside. And they've also potentially got some larval food plants and things in there. So whilst, yeah, from a pollinator's point of view, they're not necessarily as good as, um, you know, a diverse semi-natural grassland. Um, it's really important that you can kind of boost that diversity and have, you know, allow some of these species to come into flower uh, over a, as long a period of the year as you can. So really that kind of sums up all the public goods and why I think that um, multi-species lays, um, you know, herbal lays are going to be one of the things that is supported through countryside stewardship and will be supported through elms and things as well. Um, I'll go on to really just kind of summing up, summing up countryside stewardship. Obviously, if anyone's interested in countryside stewardship, we're in the application window at the moment. So now is the time that a lot of people are starting to think about herbal lays. And in the work that we do with FWAG, we do see an awful lot of people thinking, oh, well, you know, I'm going to have a crack at herbal lays because there's a really good option in countryside stewardship. And yet, whilst the kind of the payment line is very interesting, particularly for GS4, you know, there are pros and cons into jumping into using herbal lays as part of your farm system just through countryside stewardship. So it's kind of, um, particularly in GS4, they're asking for high-end management. So in GS4, they're going to pay you £309 per hectare per year. But what they want in return is quite a high value sward. So they're looking for uh, 13 species, um, 13 different species in your sward. And we've already talked about how you know, that may or may not be appropriate. The challenges of maintaining that diversity in your sward and things as well. So you have to establish those 13 species in your first year. Five species of grass, five species of herbal wildflower and three species of legume. And you have to include birds for trefoil. And so why they're asking for that high diversity again is to make sure that we're getting the maximum environmental benefits out there but they're setting the bar quite high because you have to maintain that diversity over the five years of your agreement. So what you might be looking at is having to potentially uh, re-establish uh, your sward, you know, your lay either on the same field or in a new field at some point during your agreement and all the costs that are associated with that, um, or perhaps trying to lift up that diversity by, uh, you know, stitching in or overseeding or something like that. Um, so you've got that element of risk. If you can't maintain that diversity of species within your sward, you know, are you going to be um, fulfilling the terms of your agreement? And um, they've also said within the stewardship agreements that, you know, no inorganic nitrogen can be applied. You can apply farmyard manure, but no inorganic nitrogen can be applied. So is that potentially taking away one of your management tools that might restrict you know, optimal management for farm productivity. But they are removing that, you know, they don't want you to apply inorganic nitrogen because of the air quality and the water quality benefits there. And also what you have to do within the summer is shut that sward up for five weeks at some point within the May, June, July season. So that's a long rotation. That's a 35 day rotation, if I've got my maths right, something like that. And that's really because we want to let a lot of the flowers that are within that lay come into flower to provide that pollen and nectar benefit and also to create, uh, increase that rooting depth and build up the organic matters and things in the soil. But it doesn't mean that that is particularly the optimal management for your farm. So you've got to kind of maintain this balance. So I think I'd summarise that the management and the prescriptions within countryside stewardship are weighted towards the public goods outcomes. So that's what they're emphasized on. So don't jump in and apply for the payment as part of your scheme. Perhaps unless you're confident that you can deliver that management um, in the way that the scheme requires it. And if you're, you know, if you're just trying herbal lays for the first time, um, really carefully look into the stewardship prescriptions because you don't want to end up in a situation in year three of your agreement where it's not really working for your farm but you're committed and um, you've kind of painted yourself into a corner 
Yeah, so it's really important, advice, Becky. yeah, to look at the flexibility of you know how you can make it work on your farm versus the prescriptive nature yeah. of stewardship yeah. schemes. Absolutely. I see Lupo has got a raised hand. Is that um, do you want to? I've got a question. Maybe we'll move in, start moving into the discussion. Just conscious of time here. Um, is, there, is there anything else on that, Becky? Sorry to interrupt. No, it's. Um, the yeah, only final point I would make that if you're in an organic system and you're thinking of herbal lays, then really look carefully at the organic equivalent because it's even more prescriptive and some might say not really appropriate. So, yeah, think about it carefully before going into the stewardship. Great. Thank you very much, Becky. Um, so with them. Um... Becky not being able to, the other Becky not being able to join us, we will try and pick up on the soil elements in um, the later events. Um, but thought that we could kick off the conversation really talking on that. Um, so Lupo accidentally raised his hand, it turns out, but actually that's quite handy because um, I think uh, with Becky not being here, um, perhaps you can help us with some of these questions. Um, we've, we've had quite a few come through around... Um, really kind of how to maximize those broader soil health and soil carbon um, elements of a multi-species sword um, and things around kind of the when to destroy basically um, to avoid losing those benefits. I don't know if that's something you could help us with Lupo. Oh, goes to silence. Right, just <laughs> speaking. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I can't, I can't really help in general on that, really, because it really depends very much on what the farm is trying to achieve. So, um, yeah, it's a bit not, not as easy as uh, just giving a broad spectrum answer on that. Right, yeah. So in terms of destruction of the lay, there's, there's no real broad answer. Well, it's, you know, it's also timing related. I mean, there's one thing I, I did with, uh, as one or two of you know, I'm involved with the strategic farm at AHDB. And we did one a spring reseed now two years ago in 2018, where we actually go in and did very minimum shallow cultivation, which timing there was so important because as you remember, 2018 was a dry year. And we managed to get at the end of the season the between 70 and 80 percent establishment of certain species with very minimal cultivations. Uh, because if we had gone plough and power harrowed that spring in on the 8th of May, we would have gone straight into a drought with the just very shallow cultivation and reseeding uh, was giving us, you know, a good establishment, but a uh, plough and a power harrow and a uh, normal, you know, cultivations would have really not. German, that would have not germinated. So it's very much timing related, weather related, uh, soil temperature related, site related. So I can list a whole list of <laughs> yeah. different things. So. I think it's something we need to pick up in more detail, isn't it, later on and kind of get into the nuances of that. So in another discussion, perhaps. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we did gather a few photos um, from you all um, with some questions. So have we got Anthony Slattery on the phone? I think we touched on this a little bit. Um, but Anthony was keen to know about weed management, really, in terms of dealing with undesirable species like ragwort, thistle, hogweed. Um, I think we saw some of the impacts of, of ploughing on that earlier to Deb or um, Hannah do you have any thoughts on kind of weed man any further thoughts on weed management yeah, um yeah go on Hannah go on <laughs> personally okay. and I'll chip in <laughs> okay sorry I thought you said Hannah or Deb I, I didn't mm. um so um the weeds that, that dominate um are indicate the type of management if you do, if you graze very tightly um creeping buttercup may come in and some of the annual um, um annual grasses are a problem um, there is some thought that if you mob graze or you strip graze, what you like to call it, um, the ca cattle are less able to cherry pick and that way can keep your relatively unpalatable, unpalatable docks um, under control. So 
Um, mob grazing is generally recommended for weed control and careful in grazing too tight because the understory in herbal A's is generally um, a bit thinner. So um, the general recommendations is don't go um, below about seven centimetres in the sward. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that okay, Deb? That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> And it's just it's also considering um, just have a look at your field before you plant to sow uh, a multi-species sword and just see, you know, have I got a problem with annual weeds or perennial weeds or Pacific weeds and, and talk to your seed supplier as well. And just say, you know, if I've got, as I said, we've got a problem with marsh foxtail and, and Yorkshire fog, which germinate mainly in the autumn. So if they're your two dominant weed species in your field and if you can do a spring sow then go for a spring sow to get your more established you know, your chance of your species establishing to get on some growth before those other species can germinate in the autumn so it reduces so your species um, have got larger your sown species have got larger so they can um, outcompete the autumn uh, weed species that makes a lot of sense thank you very much does Stephen have any comments about um, Yorkshire fog? <laughs> He's un unmute, unmute. Can you unmute Stephen? Sorry, yeah, I'm here. Um, yeah. Yeah, Yorkshire fog, yeah, I mean, it, it is everywhere along the side of the roads and, and it's invasive into many of the fields. Um, uh, it's quite funny because I've actually had an inquiry from the Falkland Islands for about a ton of it. So they're looking at it to plant it as a single strain uh, to feed the sheep on. So it, it, it has a place, but um, when we start talking about the, the multi-species, it, it probably um, will come in naturally. And uh, you know, what, obviously what you've got to do is, is maintain that field by, um, by cutting, by eating. And, and keeping it, its presence down to a, a minimum, really, to stop it from seeding. Yeah. Great, thank you for answering that one. Um, we had another question, um, which perhaps is similar to what we were just trying to touch on, is at which point is the lay beneficial to the soil? Um, and I think that's yeah, referring, yeah, at which point, how to kind of manage the grazing, how to manage cutting, um, to enhance those broader benefits. Is anyone able to pick up on that? Um, do you want me to? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, I think um, just um, from Becky, Wilson would obviously be able to add a lot more to this. But um, as far as soil is concerned, the organic matter is continually cycling. So um, high carbon nitrogen ratio so the mud, more woody residues will take longer to break down than the very um, leafy residues of high nitrogen carbon for example so um, the undesirable woody stems of chicory which you don't want will break down very slowly which will increase carbon but it's obviously very unpalatable and or not wanted by the livestock so um, the deeper rooting species that go down beyond 30 centimeters are more likely to have a longer lasting effect of increasing the soil carbon um, because it's obviously sort of deeper in the soil it's not breaking down so quickly so for soil health deep rooting species are generally better than the shallow rooting species um, and I think um, above ground, um, you know, farmers I've, I've worked with, um, they will not cut their silage as tight as perhaps would be the most productive. And sometimes they do that to increase the carbon in their soil in the field that they're not satisfied with. The drainage is poor or it's relatively unproductive. So you either take the, take the plant material off or cut relatively high and get it recycled back into the soil. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, I think we've got one, we'll take one more here. I'm just conscious of time. So we will try and wrap up at one, but and then if people want to stay on, we'll, we'll go through some of the additional questions as well. Um, so the last one was just from William Waterfield. Um, this is a picture of uh, his lay from last summer. And he's just asking, is this a well-balanced sword or becoming too dominated by chicory? Yep, Hannah, Stephen, yep. Um, I would say it's become too dominated by chicory. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, chicory, um, I'd graze it, um, take it down quite tight. Your grasses look quite thin. I'd give it a good dose of slurry mm -hmm. um, to deal with that, really. So graze and then slurry. 
Yeah, I think it, it, in uh, respect of um, of it, I think it, it is generally looking uh, rather too thick, really, like you're saying, and uh, mm -hmm. um, it, it is more difficult to control, perhaps, if you're getting it uh, uh, too tall as well. So it's, uh, it's something which, like you say, needs to be controlled a little bit better than that. Great. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much to all our speakers. Um, I'm just going to flick through these here. There's lots of factors to consider there. There's been a really interesting discussion in the chat there. Um, and just, it's really been a whistle-stop tour. So do stick around afterwards now if you can, and we can have uh, more of a chat. Um, there is lots more information on multi-species layers on the Agricology website and YouTube page. Um, and um, please do have a look at that. We'll also be looking to post this and relevant content on the Agricology website. And I know that Dutchie College are also planning as part of the TOMS project to pull together lots of um, resources. So your questions and feedback will really help them to guide um, what to bring together and they'll be sharing that. Um, so thank you so much to Dutch College, to Agritech Cornwall, who fund the TOMS project, um, and to um, CFE, Rothenstead, um, and um, all those engaged. Um, we I will send out a survey after this. We're still learning how to do this better. So thank you so much for your patience with all our technical hitches. Um, uh, but yeah, we'd really appreciate your feedback on how to, to address um, any of those things and how to better support you really in this strange new world that we live in um, and we have got just wanted to quickly say about some upcoming virtual events so CFE are pulling together a number of them there's one on farm carbon calculation on the 28th of May uh, and we'll be sharing more details on that we've got the second part in this series of events um, which will be led by fab farmers which Kate will tell us about in a second um, on the 4th of June and that will get into more detail on ensiling and grazing um, and the animal health elements. So hopefully we'll be able to get to some of those questions we've not been able to today on there as well. Um, and then soil biology in the cereal soil pit with NIAB. So it's with Lydia Smith. Um, we'll be looking at, um, there were, is some herbal lays in the cereals there and looking more at it in terms of in, integrating arable cropping systems and then various other events you can see there. Um, so if I can hand over to Kate to tell us a bit about the next instalment and Fabulous Farmers. Thank you very much, Katie, and I, I will be very brief, I promise. <laughs> so I just, um, I wanted just to say two words about uh, Fabulous Farmers Project, which is a project that Soil Association uh, partners in, along with National Trust and Centre for uh, Ecology and Hydrology and the Farm Carbon Cutting Toolkit as UK partners. It's a big Northwest European project, and it's all about transitioning farmers towards ag agroecological practice, um, sort of aiming for them to increase on farm efficiency and reduce their resilience, uh, um, re reliance on external inputs, increasing functional agrobiodiversity. And in order to do that, it's basically trying to get them to uh, take up some of these fab measures, as we call them. And there's some examples there on the slide. Um, and within that, uh, herbal lays or diverse lays is very much one of those um, within that sort of mixed cropping um, measure. And the, the key um, sort of deliverables or activities that we're doing um, within the UK to encourage farmers to do this is through demonstration events. So obviously we had the event at Northwick, which this is a semi-replacement for with um, along with the um, second instalment in June. And then we've established these learning networks and we've got a, a Southwest Herbal Lays learning network where we're getting groups of farmers together on each other's farms to learn and ask questions and take things forward in terms of their understanding about herbal lays um, and also sort of bringing some farms into a fold as demonstration farms and doing some monitoring on their farms so if any of you out there are interested and you're in the south so it's target areas we're working in is the southwest and also uh, Pembrokeshire and it's actually going to be wind out to Wales in, as a whole but um, herbal lays work is predominantly focused in the southwest so if you are interested in being part of a learning network or a demo farm or anything do please get in contact with me um, my email address is on the bottom of the slide there um, 
so we've got the second instalment of um, of this series. Um, thank you so much to Rothamsted and Duchy and all the partners um, involved and FWAG for, for, for giving all your wonderful expertise. So um, in part two, we're going to be um, looking more, as we said, at sort of grazing and silage and cutting and learning more from the TOMS project, the precision grazing project and the assist project that are all um, coming out of Rothamsted. We'll also be looking a little bit at um, one of the Imitative Farmers field labs that I've been working with some farmers on, um, looking at sort of grazing intensity and how that can help maintain species diversity. So please, please do come along to the second session on the 4th and so Association Stroke Fab will be hosting that one and we'll make sure that you have all the sign up details and everything um, as soon as they're ready. But, um, but thank you ever so much to everyone for all your input and questions today very 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 informative yeah it's fantastic <laughs> hasn't it yeah it's so interesting yeah, yeah thanks everyone for sharing your thoughts absolutely in the comments of, and questions great okay well thank you so much everyone um i think yeah we'll stick around here but if you do need to go and if you've got zoom fatigue and you want to get out in that sunshine we understand uh, we will be recording the rest of this bit as well so you can catch up on that later if you'd like to um, but just want to try and pick up on some of these burning questions that people have. Um, Lydia Smith, would you like to kick off with your one around the countryside stewardship mix? Okay, am I unmuted? You are unmuted. So we had quite a lively discussion on your questions, but I, I wanted to put the question specifically to the countryside stewardship people because uh, I just picked up on the fact that uh, Birdsfoot Treffer was a requirement for um, one of the mixtures. And I can see why it's a requirement because I know it's got huge benefits uh, that we saw in the discussion for wildlife and pollinators, etc. However, uh, I know that for these kind of complex herbal lays, we've slightly struggled to establish both at Trefoil in dry uh, alkaline soils, whereas we find it really easy for sanfoin. And uh, a lot of the attributes that you attach to birds for trefoil, we can achieve those with sanfoin. And it, it, it worries me because if farmers have absolutely got to have birds for trefoil and they can't establish it, then they are effectively excluded from the uh, scheme. Yeah, and um, it does say, I was trying to find if there might be a slight loophole in, it might say, you know, your seed mix must contain birds for trefoil. And I thought, well, if you can evidence that the seed mix contains it, then even if it doesn't grow, you can say, look, it went in. But it does say, make sure that the sward contains at least five species of grass. Um, and I can't, I've just been having a quick look now to find out whether kind of the forage birds for trefoil has the same wildlife fat. I can't find any answers to that. And I've been looking, sometimes I use this website called Conservation Evidence, which kind of shows a lot of the research. It groups together a lot of the papers and things that have gone into um, the reasons why these particular requirements have been put in. Um, and I can't find anything specifically about birds for trefoil there. So part of me wonders whether this is just one of the things that has crept into stewardship because someone's gone, oh, birds for trifle is really good, make sure they do that. <laughs> and lo and behold, it's now on the screen. Um, what I would do, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want people to be put off using GS4 just because of that. And, and, I, and I think it's the case of, it must be in the seed mix that you establish. Um, so that can be used as evidence for coming up for an inspection or something like that. You know, I've done the correct mix and it was definitely in there. Um, I would take photos of any areas where Buzzfoot Trefoil has been successful as photographic evidence, but there is that risk in there. Although saying that, um, what we've been hearing with countryside stewardship going forward, as opposed to the last few years, is that RPA inspections are going to take the format much more of site visits and um, discussing compliance with the farmers and having a kind of a, um, a mutually beneficial, you know, experience rather than, or oh, there's no buzz for trefoil, you, you know, you've been penalised. So if people are going into stewardship from this year onwards, I would be positive and say that if you've, you know, if you've got the right mix, the right seed mix 
you've done the best that you can to establish it and if you're meeting all the other conditions then i would be surprised if there was if they were penalized for the fact that birds for trefoil was not successful particularly if you can say but i do have these vetches and i've got sandfoil and i've got you know things like this there I mean, should I be that flexibility that's uh, that sort of gets you part way there but the birds for trefoil is there for a reason so if you don't put something in instead of it and you fail then you do have less good quality so it worries me a little bit uh and and i think you know i get this comment a lot from farmers that i talk to if there is a a rather strict requirement that mm. they find it very difficult to meet it is very off-putting and yeah, it's absolutely a yeah. scheme so i just really want to say I, I hear what you're saying is the fix, but I, I think you probably should go a little step further, maybe. Yeah, it's not. It's de it's definitely not a hundred percent. And the other thing that when you know we're talking to farmers um, and they're saying, well, what kind of evidence? I don't know how many species I've got. I couldn't recognise. You know, you're trusting that the seed mix is correct, but when things are coming through, and particularly when they might have already been grazed once, the farmers can't necessarily recognise that those thirteen different species in the sward. And they're saying, how will I know whether it's all been successful? How do I know whether, you know, these, I've got all these species. Mm. And I say, well, equally, the RPA may well not be able to recognise <laughs> these. <laughs> um, so your invoice from your seed company and the advice from your seed specialist and the evidence that you've established it well would, should be enough. But there is, that is a risk. That is a, that is a risk there. And you know, it's a lot of money to be um, taking a bit of a gamble on, I suppose. Yeah. Hopefully, going forward, I mean, we keep on feeding this back to um, like RPA and to DEFRA and things, that these are blockers for people taking up what is a really effective and beneficial option. So hopefully in the next generation, we will be moving away from this overly prescriptive requirements. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, hopefully we can see some kind of transformation there. Um, I'm wondering if we've still got Andy Phillips on the line. Um, just a question around using glyphosate or inorganic fertilizing impact on soil biology. I mean, I guess that's probably more one for Becky anyway. Is that something anyone else can pick up on or not so much? I, I gave quite a general kind of cop out answer there, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> because I can't find any re I can't find any research. There was a bit about earthworms, but eventually, basically, your community, your your biological, you know, your microbiology and your macrobiology community evolves to one that it can cope with glyphosate, and that's going to be a narrower diversity than you will have had before. And so, all the kind of knock-on impacts of if you're reducing your diversity, you know, in your fungal communities, your microbial communities and things, then you're reducing your potential benefits. But as um, Niall said, the, 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 the same thing happens with physical cultivations and things as well. Each time you, you mess around with things, you are going to be having an impact on your soil biology. It's just how quickly can it bounce back and, you know, how much of an impact is it going to have? It's kind of like three steps forward and maybe one step back each time you apply it or each time you cultivate. Um, yeah. Yep. Great. Thank you. Um, have we got Jack Healy on the line still? So if you want to ask your question. Uh, yeah, I'm still here. Yeah. Great. Um, I'm just wondering, kind of, uh, how how long the species would last in the in the sward. Uh, I've heard figures being kind of thrown around of about uh, four years before they need to be receded. I'm just wondering, it's kind of expensive enough to to establish the sward in the first place. Is is that people's um, is that is that what people are finding in practice as well? Or I think particularly the red clover three yeah. or four years. Maybe other species can persist a bit longer, but to keep for in stewardship anyway, you need at least that 10% of red clover. Um, and it's the same thing, you know, the, what we were talking about with Lydia, it's if you can't maintain that level of diversity, if you're in a stewardship to go back in and have to reseed the whole thing, when really you might be quite happy with a sward that's got nine different species in it, 
and so you're only reseeding just to satisfy your stewardship obligations. That is an expensive um, undertaking. So what some people are doing for stewardship anyway is just re-establishing a new, you know, keeping on with their slightly less diverse ward and, um, you know, re-establishing a stewardship plot on a new bit of ground. And um, so doubling your area effectively. Has anyone else on the line got any other questions that wants to unmute themselves? I had one around pollinators. It yeah, might... Rich, Richard Piewell's team at CH, they've done a lot of work on pollinators, especially Ben, or a surname's gone, but Richard Piewell's um, team, they've got a lot of publications. I should know because I've worked with Ben. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember his name either. But we have got some bits written by him on agroecology as well. He, he wrote up the findings. Are you talking about Marek? Marek? No, Ben no, Woodcock. No. Ben Woodcock, that's the one. Uh, yeah. So uh, he did. Uh, he wrote up the results from the Webb experiment looking at pollinators. He, um, he published a good paper on that. Also regarding the um, certain species that were selected, for the EK21, then the, which turns into the GS4 um, agro-environment scheme. Um, there's a review by Simon Mortimer <coughs> at Reading University. And that was, I think that was sort of like the template because basically you could look at that and see how many pollinators or insects and birds looking at seeds were associated with which species. And Natural England used that for a, a reference, I think. So I think that's why some of the species that are currently prescribed in um, the herbal A mixes are currently used but I agree totally agree the agro environment schemes need to be a lot more flexible and give farmers room to maneuver to tailor specific seed mixes to their specific uh, you know fields and management styles as long as you've got grass stacking forbs in that's delivering mm. on a wide you know environment deliver both on production and the environment then there's lots of room to maneuver so, yeah. do you have any idea why the organic rules are so different in terms of long grazing, like 10 week return period and all those Yeah, kind of because uh, that's quite interesting because when we did, I think the web experiment, I'm trying to think back, it's a long time ago now, I think we had, was it a four or six week shut off uh, the rest of the treatment versus the typical treatment? Mm. And that was deemed to work fairly well for the pollinators and not compromise your production too much. But I'm not sure why it's so extensive for the organic. I'm not sure where that magic figure came from. Yeah, it's it's really it doesn't it means I, I've never put on a herbal lay. I don't think for anyone doing an organic agreement because they like they just can't manage that early block and late block and nothing at all. You know, no grazing or anything or cutting in July and a ten like if you've got chicory in there, a ten week return. You're, my chicory is going to be over my head. I mean, I'm only short, but it's <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we've, we've quite... certainly got some uh, um, organic farmers in the um, in the field lab who've got herbal lays, and they said exactly the same thing that they wouldn't like in dairy systems. They just wouldn't yeah. be able to utilize them as a as an organic option because they need to keep the the um, forage so much lusher and mm. shorter, and wouldn't be able to leave it like you say for it to go so woody and flowery. Mm -hmm. And the kind of the lower payment, kind of the justification I heard was that, oh, well, organic farmers are doing it anyways. So, you know, we don't need to pay them so much. But the argument is if they're providing all these public goods, then they, that, that's the value. It doesn't matter whether somebody would have been doing it anyway. If it's the same, hopefully the same outcomes. But um, it's, uh, you know, I think that's another thing to think about going forward is a bit more equality between different approaches, really. Yeah, definitely. I've um, got another question here. We've got Coleman Dealey. Do you want to ask your question, please? Unmute yourself if you're still there. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, but the question is about um, under sowing um, this time of the year, or maybe in the last couple of weeks, to a crop of, say, urban silage or even just in barley or oats or triticale or something, in order to, if a person wanted to establish a crop, and to, does it establish well in, in under in under sowing? Simple question. So, anyone got any comments on under sowing? Um, any experiences there, Deb? 
Meet. <laughs> I keep forgetting, sorry. <laughs> I'm not very technical. Um, <laughs> You're doing very well. <laughs> we're, all, we're, all, we're all learning here, aren't we? <laughs> um, so, so basically, we haven't actually tried that at Northwick, but we also uh, are involved in a SARIC funded project with Reading University and Duchy. Um, Hannah, I don't know if Hannah's still there, basically yeah. she, she's leading on the farms with that, looking at um, you know, about eight to ten farms across. And I think one of the a couple of farms did try it under sewing, didn't they, Hannah, with not too much success? Is that right? Um, well, um, I think um, the the general, yeah, I mean, I can only give anecdotal evidence from farmers. I can't, I, I haven't been involved in any trials comparing everything equally and um, yeah. statistically. Um, so um, I know Richard Gantlett at Yatesbury Organic Farm up in Wiltshire, so he's on some dry land. Um, he said that he would much prefer under sewing um, herbal lays in, than putting them in direct because he gets a much better balance of species um, underneath rather than getting too much grass. I think it's because he's under sewing under barley and the barley takes away the extra, excess nitrogen so it will encourage the legumes to come forward and so and also um, I think the shading or it will affect the water balance. Another farm I was working with up um, Taunton, up on very clay land, he under sowed um, the herbal lays under, under barley um, and he, it was very successful again. Um, the barley was under a reduced seed rate um, and again it was in the, but that land can get quite cold in the winter and early spring so I don't know if the under sown crop provides some sort of cover to protect it. So I've come across two situations both of which have been successful, um, but I haven't got any good fair comparisons, if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, does, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. Hi. And something, please, William Waterfield, sorry for the late attention. <laughs> Dry land, I would always go for a, a spring under so, on the basis that somebody reduces the seed rate of the, cup of the main crop. Um, I always say to people, what are you really trying to do? Are you trying to establish a lay or are you hoping that a lay might establish and you're really after a cereal crop? Mm. If it's the latter, then why bother? If you're really wanting to achieve establishment of a, of a, a herbal lay, then on the dry land, uh, we would go for a spring, spring planting. Mm. That makes sense. Also had a comment here from Dave Davis around the timing of the cutting of the cereal crop would have a big impact on establishment as well. Mm -hmm. um, have we, are there any more questions in the group? There are any more comments that anything that we haven't picked up on that? Um, I'm conscious there were lots of questions in the chat there. Um, if anyone's got any final questions. If not, then I think we will wrap up here. Thank you so much, everyone, for lively participation and um, to our speakers for just sharing so much useful, practical information there. Um, I think we'll probably need to watch some of it again to, to take it all, but I think you did a really good job of, of laying those things out very clearly. So thank you very much. Um, we, as I mentioned, we will pull all of this together on a web page on agroecology and link that to, to the partner sites and we'll try and make sure we're addressing um, questions that have come up um, by linking to different resources that we already have there on agroecology and as we mentioned, we'll make, try to pick up on as much as we can in the next event on the 4th of June where we're looking more at the insiding and grazing and animal health benefits. Um, so yeah, thanks again, everyone. Great to see you here. Um, take care of yourselves, and um, thank you. we hope to see you again soon. Yeah, thank you very much, Katie. Yeah, thank, thank you, Katie. You